Welcome, everyone. My name is Jennifer Gibson. I'm director curator of Gallery 1C03, which is the campus art gallery of the University of Winnipeg. Um, thank you very much for coming late this afternoon to Unsettling the Spirits, which is a panel discussion in conjunction with the exhibition The Undead Archive, 100 Years of Photographing Ghosts, curated by Dr. Serena Kashavji. I'd like to give a land acknowledgement. I would like to acknowledge that here at Gallery 1 CO3, the University of Winnipeg rather, we are located on Treaty 1 territory, the heartland of the Red River Métis and ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe, Inanu, Anish Inanu, Dakota and Dene peoples. And I also want to give gratitude for the water that we drink and that we use um, and that it is here um, due to Shoal Lake 40 First Nation, uh, people who've suffered great cost actually over many years for us to be able to have uh, clean drinking water. Um, so as I said, this panel, Unsettling the Spirits, is in conjunction with the Undead Archive exhibition. Um, if you don't know much about the exhibition, it's a three-part exhibition. So part of the exhibition is at 1C03 here on the main floor of Centennial Hall. And part of the exhibition is at the University of Manitoba Archives and Special Collections. And another part of the exhibition is at the School of Art Gallery at the University of Manitoba. So I would certainly highly recommend going to see the show. Um, it's up in our, our venues until at least November 10th and even beyond that at the archives. Um, so for today's discussion, um, Dr. Serena Kashevji, who's in front of me here, has invited exhibiting artists Erica DeFreitas, who's beside her, and Paul Robles, Casey Adams, Krista Rose, and respons respondent Catherine Van Rienen to um, discuss uh, the role that ghosts and intuition play in their art making. And I want to give a shout out and a note of thanks to the Space Between Us Research Project and to the Manitoba Arts Council for funding and supporting today's event. Um, so now I'm going to introduce Dr. Keshav G, who is a professor of art and architectural history here at the University of Winnipeg. Her research focuses on the intersection of art and science in visual culture. Widely published in these subjects, Dr. Keshav G discovered the ghost photographs in the Hamilton family fawns at the University of Manitoba Archives and Special Collections in 1997. And then in 2019, she received a shirt grant to contextualize these photographs, which resulted in the exhibition, The Undead Archive, and the edited collection that is soon to be published and made available through uh, University of Manitoba Press. She's holding it right there for us, The Art of Ectoplasm. So if you can make it on November 1st at McNally Robinson at 7 p.m., there'll be a book launch. Um, but for now, I am going to pass it over to Serena. There's going to be an opportunity for the artists to discuss their practices. And, um, and then Catherine will be a respondent, discussant to the conversation. And then at the very end, we'll open it up to you, the audience, for a question and answer. OK, thanks very much. Thank you, Jennifer. Can you guys all hear me? OK. Um, so I want to thank Jennifer. I want to thank Blair Fornwald and Heather Bedinsky, the directors of the three venues. My curatorial assistants are here, Christina Thompson, Emma Dukes, and Ali uh, Bayrat. I relied on them for every aspect of the exhibition in the book, so I want to thank them. Catherine Van Rienen is here, who's doing a PhD on the Hamilton photos and is our discussant, and will add some comments at the end. And I have to thank my students, who were forced to come here, <laughs> but who have done one wonderful written responses to the artworks. So it was a revelation to me as I was researching my book that there were over 25 artists who have made work based on the Hamilton modernist photographs and more generally on the concepts of spirit communication through the substance of ether, of ectoplasm, or vaporous smoky screens. And today, four of these artists are here. So Casey Adams, Paul Robles, Erica DeFreitas, and Krista Rose. I hope all of you will make the trek out to the University of Manitoba to see the other parts of the exhibition. We'll keep the gallery open tonight a little bit after this panel. But in the meantime, I have installation shots of their art floating around. Are they moving or are they stuck? Okay. 
we might be stuck. We will, we will have uh, moving shots soon. So we have about an hour together, and I plan on asking the artists a few questions in three rounds. So round one, um, I'm going to start. Um, psychical science and spiritualism is the crux of the Hamilton's intense 12-year research project in Winnipeg. It's very much a white settler project that developed out of the 1919 pandemic, the 1919 uh, general strike, two disruptive periods in Winnipeg's history that generated a lot of gatekeeping in many different ways, including how to conjure ghosts. For the Hamiltons, there was only one way, and that was through a laboratory and using a scientific model. So from the artists here especially, I learned that one, there's a contemporary interest in um, these ideas and a global interest in spirit communication. Many people around the world still communicate with spirits. So my first round, I want um, you each to introduce yourselves um, in any way you feel comfortable. But also on this round, I want you to tell me how you discovered the Hamilton photographs, or generally, what drew you to thinking about communication with the dead in your art practice, which I thought was very unusual. Go so we'll start with Erica. Sure. I'm not sure which mic to speak. I guess you can hear me in either one. My name is Erica DeFreitas, and I'm an artist from Toronto. Um, thank you so much for having me here today and for being here. Um, so I came across the, I guess one thing that I'd like for you to know is uh, background-wise, my mother's from Guyana, my father's from Trinidad. So there is a Caribbean, West Indian kind of um, foundational knowledge for me, um, so when I speak about a lot of these things, it's coming from that background. Uh, so I came to Winnipeg in 2010 and did a residency at MAWA. And as I was doing my residency, I was doing an artist talk. And Elvira Finnegan mentioned, I was describing my, my photos, and I'm doing this because it's like the doilies coming out of my mouth. And Elvira had suggested that I go and take a look at the, the uh, archives. And so I had gone to go see the archives and was unwrapping. I don't know what they looked like when you went, but they were in these banker boxes at the time and in scrapbooks and just like papers put together. And I sat there for a day unraveling as many things as I could and photographing and scanning things. Because uh, what I really took from it was kind of the layout of, of the, the photographs and how they were kind of um, displayed in the, in the scrapbooks, which helped to influence how my work was then displayed. And that's about Thank it. You. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Paul Robles. Um, I guess my background is I was born in the Philippines, but I came to Canada in the early 70s with my mom and dad and siblings. So very similar tropes to new immigrants where we were basically sponsored in uh, with the first Trudeau, uh, Pierre, and uh, we moved, settled in Winnipeg because of my uncle, and we kind of, I grew up in Wolseley, which was not Wolseley now, it was Wolseley when it was quite, um, it wasn't gentrified at that time, so I grew up in sort of like in the core of downtown Winnipeg, and um, yeah, so I, and I went to school like um, in sort of primarily in, in the Wolsey area, and Gordon Bell was my high school. So I, I sort of, I, I was four years old when I came. So I'm, I'm basically Canadian. Um, my mom and dad really encouraged our siblings to assimilate. So I didn't, I lost my Filipina, Filipino interests and I can understand a bit of the language, but I was sort of in that middle space when I grew up. So I, I had like European friends, like most of my friends were from, you know, um, Europe, like they were German or Italian or white. So I kind of, I sort of like grew up that way. And then um, went to school here, went to University of Winnipeg. I got a degree here in sociology and I went to School of Art because I was into um, the visual arts. And then, um, so this is, that was my second degree. And um, I started out as a photographer and we're talking about analog photography <laughs> with uh, negatives and printing. And uh, um, I first encountered the Hamilton uh, was with, through David McMillan who suggested um, looking at these 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 photographs that were in the UVM, um, I was always interested in in ghosts and um, sort of the middle space and and sort of other other worlds because I, I've always been fascinated. I think that came from being super Roman Catholic and I was an altar boy and um, so th those those worlds all melded with me. So I've always interested in the uh, sort of the otherness of of um, of, of I guess 
our, our being here on, on this planet. So that's how I encountered the uh, Hamilton um, photographs. I love horror movies. I've always loved horror movies. So it was just right up my alley in the, in the 90s when I went to go see them. So that's how I discovered those photographs. Yeah. <laughs> Mino Takasen, Kapapama Piminat, Mikasua Squayo, Nitisina Kassel, Ni Mama Judy Adams. I have to look at my cheat sheet here. Ishte Gasco, O Chikewe CP, Ni Utu Timak, Ni Papa Leslie Adams, Ishte Gasco, Peguis First Nation, Ni Itu Timak. I said hello. All my relations, good evening. Um, my Cree name is Flying Overhead Circles Eagle Woman, and I am of the Bear Clan. Uh, my mother is Judy Adams from Fisher River Cree Nation. My father's uh, family is from Peguis First Nation. Uh, yeah, Peguis First Nation. And uh, I am also of settler descent as well. Um, and I heard about the um, collection through conversations with Serena. Um, and my interest in uh, ghosts or spirits really stemmed from uh, First of all, after having my son, I started thinking about my own mortality, and we started thinking about um, about the what happens when we pass. And I started learning a lot about my culture, and I started to understand that the teachings the elders were were teaching me. And when I speak about my culture, in Inu, uh, which is Cree, and Anishinaabe, which people know as Ojibwe. Um, the teachings that I had been receiving often talks about how uh, we don't think of linear time. Instead, we think of like circular time. So we're constantly going, revolving between past, present, and future. And so my body uh, is an embodiment of the past. It's part of the present and part of the future. And so the ancestors, the spirits, are always with you. It's embedded in your body and your DNA, which gives you understandings of um, what what to do, how to move forward, and and that. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, can everyone hear me? My name's Chris Darosh, and. Um, there's a few ways that I could enter this. One way is my practice itself. Um, a lot of the themes in my work actually deal with technology. So um, pervasive media, human flow, um, our, uh, where our physical being is going in the age of technology. And I actually live between Winnipeg and San Francisco. So I've been in San Francisco for 25 years, which is sort of the hotbed of uh, technocracy. So that's, um, as a painter, um, I felt that that was really important to dialogue with technology somehow and figure out where our, our human physicality um, is situated. And all along, there was this little inkling in the back of my head that this has something to do with spirituality and ghosts. And I was just telling Casey that um, when I had her headphone on, her headset, she did a, a virtual reality piece, just for a split second, um, sort of a default program came up. And I found myself sitting, not on a couch, but the couch was sitting through me, and I didn't have hands. And it just confirmed what I knew, that technology would make living ghosts of us all. So I, like, in terms of my um, uh, theoretical program, uh, this subject interests me. But also on a familial level, and I think we're all sort of coming from different cultures, um, my grandmother, who came to Winnipeg in uh, 19, when was it, Serena? You did some research on this. 13, to yeah. train as a nursing sister. Uh, she uh, is, was, she's dead now, she was first cousins with W.B. Yeats, and in fact, um, grew up in his household. And he was the great Irish poet and also um, mystic. And interestingly, his interest in the occult and mysticism came from my mother's family. Uh, George Pollux Finn was one of the founding members of the Hermetic Order of uh, the Golden Dawn um, with Yeats. They were both members of the uh, Theosophy Society. 
and members of the, um, the uh, Ghost Club, which was started in 1913 mm -hmm. to uh, scientifically research paranormal um, happenings in the world. And they became sort of this expert to go to about, you know, is it real? Let's do some science behind it. So needless to say, um, like with this in sort of the background of my family, uh, I've always been interested and open to pluralistic ways of understanding the world. Interestingly, a lot of the family members were pretty ordinary Victorians, but they needed certain ways to describe and understand conflicting things in society social, economic, spiritual, that were happening, happening at the turn of the century, including the pandemic, the First World War, um, Spanish influenza, um, there was a civil war in Ireland where the family came from and so forth. And uh, I think that's where my interest as an artist comes in. Um, I read something to prepare for this in the New York Times. This journalist said, I'm always surprised when a smart person asked me what my sign is. The subtext being, you're not so smart if you believe in anything that isn't concrete and rational. But I would flip that on its head. I think smart people do draw from all sorts of things, the scientific, established religion, um, your own spiritual spirituality, and so forth. So that's sort of the big ball of wax of my interest. Catherine, you want to? Oh, sure. <clears throat> Can everyone hear me? Uh, so I am a PhD student at the University of Manitoba, and I came to the Hamilton Archives in um, like an extremely pragmatic and boring way, which is that I needed a PhD project. <laughs> <And> <laughs> So uh, I did my master's um, at Concordia with Jeremy Stolo, who's a scholar of religion and media. And he was always doing this weird thing where he's studying ghosts and aura imaging technologies. And I was like, that's cool. But I was studying the 16th century Wunderkammer. Um, but then I moved here, and I was like, I want to do a PhD um, at the University of Manitoba. So I went on the archive, uh, the University of Manitoba Archives and Special Collections page and was looking through, just sort of wondering, like, hmm, is there a project here? And then I came across the Hamilton archive, and I said, there's definitely a project here. So I'm, I'm really interested, kind of like Chris, in the sort of technology aspect of it. I'm very interested in how technology and media are um, involved in, in even uh, creating our distinctions or demarcations between things like religion and science or pseudoscience and the supernatural. And now I get to work with Serena. She's on my committee, so yay. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I feel like there's a few things we're going to come back to, like intuition, uh, superstition, uh, familial superstitions that get passed on. I think it's sort of interesting. And definitely when you guys go and see the exhibition, technology, old and new technology, are prevalent. Uh, many of the artists have used old analog techniques, even glass plates. Um, overhead projectors in a performance, so old technology um, and being reworked in new ways and sometimes with new technology definitely is one of the themes here. All right, so round two. Um, some of the artworks uh, in this exhibition were commissioned, especially for the show, and you have to realize that most of them were made during the pandemic, which I find very interesting because that's what we were doing, sometimes, sometimes talking over Zoom, occasional in-person meetings, but they did develop from, let's say, 2020 until recently, which I think is interesting. Other pieces were made many years ago, so um, Erica mentioned a little bit her piece. Um, there are hundreds, right, of teleplasmic studies, and I, um, they were made in 2010, but I stumbled across them. I think it was at art camp, someone mentioned to me, and then I looked them up, and there was a Canadian art article with three measly little images <laughs> in 2015. But that's when I realized that um, artists were looking at these photos as artworks, and they were not worried about them as failed science. And I had been kind of stuck in this idea of them as failed science and trying to explain this alternative or pseudoscience. So this opened up the idea for me to do a curatorial project, to do the art of ectoplasm. And this book is full of my curatorial interpretations. And so for this round, I want you to explain your piece in the exhibition to us. 
us. Um, and think about all these people are going to be going and seeing it. What do you want to say to them in your own words about your piece? And they are moving here, so everyone should come up, a version of everybody's. So Erica, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, so in, I mentioned in 2010 I had come to Winnipeg to do residency at MAWA. And what I had brought with me was just a stack of doilies that my grandmother had made. So hearing everybody talk about their background is really quite interesting to me because I, I never had an opportunity to meet my grandmother. And so I'm not um, aware of a lot of the familial lineage that, that, can, that happens. Um, so I like to think about my knowledge of my familial lineage as being imagined. Um, as a way of learning through my mom um, the, the history of my family. But I see these doilies that my grandmother had made around the house, and I imagine myself learning about my grandmother through the doilies that she made. So each sort of you know knot made to create this doily is so precious to me because my grandmother's hand had touched this and had spent time. And so there are like these documents of time as well. So the reason why I had brought them with me is because I had a, what I would call an adopted grandmother. Um, she was somebody who took care of me since I was eight months old and kind of, you know, lived life with. And I was with her when she had passed away. And what had really kind of struck me was the type of silence that remained uh, when the body became empty. And I had been reading a lot of Derrida at the time and really thinking about this idea of silencing. And so I just envisioned this moment of silencing myself with my, my grandmother's doilies. Um, and I hadn't quite thought about them any further than that, other than the act of silencing. And I worked with Larry Glosson, who's a photographer here, who came over to the Mawa apartment one day and humored me while I stuffed my mouth with doilies, and he photographed. And he was so kind, he didn't ask any questions. <laughs> <you know? laughs> um, but it was during my an artist talk that I was describing these photographs that it was then recommended that I go and check out Dr. Hamilton's archives at the university. And so I was taken to the university and able to experience the, the archives firsthand. And that helped me to be able to articulate this idea of silencing, but in a way it was also like I was silencing myself with my grandmother's doilies, but then she's also emerging. So there's this kind of duality that happens there. And thinking about this idea of the ingestion of, of family knowledge and family history all becoming present. The photographs are quite large in scale. I tend to work quite large with um, portraiture uh, as a way of occupying space. So what became really interesting for me was as a woman of uh, a racialized body that I could then occupy so much space with such absurd imagery, um, but it still be um, allow a room for questions. So so much of it is about the idea of possibilities and, and thinking through that. So many things I have to say, but um, one of my students said that she felt you were communicating with your grandma through the doilies. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a nice link. Mm -hmm. But also the idea of silence. So the mediums were all female, or mostly female in the Hamilton Archive, and they were meant to be vessels. They were meant to be silent. They didn't have their own voice. In fact, to be a good medium, you have to lose your voice, and you have to be the empty vessel for the spirit to come through. So you're updating that, but the invisible labor of women and grandmas and racialized women, I felt really came through with yours. Thank you. Yeah, like I think about these women whose histories are often untold, and I use my practice as an opportunity to try to provide some space for that. So thinking about my grandmother, thinking about my mother, these are women whose histories may never have been shared before. But through this, um, this pathway there, there's an opportunity for them to also have other people reflected in their stories as well. And Angela DeFreitas's doilies, three of them, are in the exhibition, and it's everybody's favorite. Everyone, oh, you know, <laughs> people just keep radiating to that cabinet. So. Oh, that's wonderful. Thanks. Paul? Bye. Um, well, my pieces, I guess, I guess I should I should start off where um, um, I started working with. Well, I've always cut paper like now for about twelve years, but I guess at the beginning of like researching sort of the other side, 
was probably starting in um, 2011 when my dad passed away at the end of the year. And I started making these sort of very minimal black moons that um, were a bunch of series um, sort of uh, honoring his passing. So that was in 2011. But then um, as we fast forward to 2019, another sort of cast like incident in my life, which basically was the burning of my studio, um, which lost a lot of those moons, um, happened uh, here in Winnipeg. So I basically, again, started like from scratch. And at, at one point when, when um, you know, everything settled, um, I was even questioning, should I continue being an artist? Because I basically lost all my work in this, in this, this warehouse fire. Um, going to art camp, also helped with that. So there's an annual art camp that we used to do to Riding Mountain, and Serena happened to be part of that group, and she had mentioned about have you know researching the Hamilton archives. So um, once uh, all said and done, and we got a, I got a, a new studio, um, I started to um, think about again sort of the other side of things and and other world in spiritualism and stuff like that, and. Um, and before my work was very um, minimal, not, not minimal, but sort of like framed, enclosed sort of pieces. And I decided in this new space that I would just break away from the frame and um, start producing this, which she, she, I don't remember saying this, but I called them dream vomits. But um, I kept them, I called them clumps. So I basically wanted to get out of the frame pieces and sort of just fill my wall of of sort of the lexicon of my my um, my uh, my practice. So I had all these. So I, I cut I cut paper, and um, a lot of the characters are are sort of based on the Asian zodiacs. So the year of. So I'm I am a rooster, and most of you guys know your animal familiars. So um, a lot of the the characters in my my clumps and my and the pieces that you see at UVM are sort of these reoccurring characters that will come out um, out of the wall and um, sort of and so I was and I was thinking of, of spew and ectoplasm and and things like that so it's just a mishmash of um, these characters that were once you know part of my practice and they still are but um, I think the the fire really just said you know let you know, let's get them all out there now and 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 sort of um, be present for them. So what you see at the gallery are, are two clumps uh, or two. I call them murmurations because they're sort of based on, on on the on the sparlings and the the, the mystical flying part where they're all flying in in um, in unison, which scientists still don't know why they do that. But um, so I I, um, I call them murmurations, but uh, slash clumps. And you'll see a, a magenta one and you'll see a blue one at uh, UVM. Um, so that that's where my pieces come from. So and and like Erica's, um, a lot of my upbringing and um, thinking of of spirituality really does come from my grandma. She and, and Filipino grandma, my nana, and she's the one that sort of had those folklores and and tales of uh, you know you, you better be good and and or else you know the the the, the aswang which is a witch in in philippines will come and get you so a lot of that stuff <laughs> a lot of that stuff comes from my 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 grandma who um sort of as kids we were always sort of told to be good or else you know something will come after you sort of thing so mm -hmm. so that's the pieces in in the show here I personally love dream vomits because it is the ideoplastic Freudian interpretation of ectoplasm. And 100% Dr. Hamilton in the 20s would have understood that term because there were doctors who were studying this who didn't believe in ghosts and thought it was um, an expression of the, of the mind, of the unconscious yeah. mind. So I circle dream vomits. I use it all the time. It's perfect. <laughs> but it's also, it's, interesting that Paul found this term that fits in with the 1920 description yeah. so well. But it's also was, a, a, again, a revelation to me that Erica did these photos before she saw the Hamilton archives. We have them in the gallery beside each other, the photographs and your photos, and they really, I thought you'd mimic the photos, but it was the other way around. So strange coincidences or intuitions that have <laughs> kind of crept in through the show? <laughs> and when... Uh well, me and Serena did visits through Zoom because of COVID, and she would just see the clumps behind me, starting off very small. I don't know if there's images there, and then 
you know, as we did Zooms uh, yearly, we, she would just see this thing behind me that was growing almost like the blob. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think that's how you got and You never actually saw the real piece until I put it up at the gallery uh, the, the couple days before the opening. Yeah, that's true. I only saw them on Zoom, but they grew like amoebas. And you guys may or may not know this, but ectoplasm is meant to be cellular plasm. It is based on the germ and the amoeba and how the amoeba moves. And Paul seemed to intuit this because his are very vitalistic yeah. and very much like um, the way amoeba would. They they had arms, they had and pseudopods, arms. Yeah. right? Yeah. So, so. They, the 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 layout in my studio is very different from what you see in the gallery. So it really reflects the space that they're in too. So um, I, I can install them in different ways. And one actually is coming through the corner. So yeah, it's pretty malleable. Those those pieces. So yeah, okay. yeah. Casey has a very high tech uh, version, but it also includes a ghost vessel. And that came later for me, and I love that idea. Yeah, um, so I'm just gonna share uh, a teaching that um, I learned from Floyd Sutherland from Peg West First Nation. And he, he says that the spirit originates from the cosmos, from the, um, uh, the North Star constellations. And a bright light travels down to your mother's womb. And um, when we pass, um, then that sacred light, we would light a sacred fire that, uh, so that allows the spirit to travel back to that spirit realm. And, and so my piece was really thinking about also a teaching that I, I uh, learned from um, uh, what's his name? <laughs> oh my God, uh, Albert McLeod um, from Norway House. Uh, he he basically talks about how when you smudge and you create that smoke, that smoke can conjure up the spirits, and those spirits can be like your ancestors, or it could be like the Thunderbirds. And so I was really interested in those kind of those two teachings, and so my piece is inspired by a woman that was found from in Split Lake back in 1993 due to the hydro dam um, flooding. Um, Bruce Tate and Bob Moose came across an Innu woman and her burial at the south end of Nagami Bay at South Indian Lake. And the community named her Keya Sochi Koyoko Minuin which means grandmother from long ago. And like anyone who is um, older than us um, is considered a grandmother, even though she never was a grandmother, she was just a mother. But she, that child went on to have children and such forth. So, um, so I wanted to, I started thinking about what was it like for her when, when she passed? What was it like for the loved one? The, the, the person who took such care in her burial. And uh, I knew I couldn't really give you an understanding of what it's like because it's a spiritual, it's a very emotional kind of feeling. And so Serena and I were talking about maybe video, but then um, my good friend Casey Koizan, who is a VR creator, um, he showed me one of his pieces and I thought, you know what, this is a great opportunity to create something where you feel it, where you feel her passing, you feel those moments, you're, you actually feel like you're at the boreal forest where this is happening. So all of that is just my imagination of, of, of what happened when she passed. And um, the ghost vessel did come later because uh, a long time ago, Candace Hopkins, um, told me about ghost beads, I believe it was. And um, I think it, um, from what I remember, uh, she was telling me that it was a way to honor those spirits, those people that, that pass on and that you carry it with you. And so I flipped that and, and wanted to put these in, like make a ghost vessel to put water in and to put food in because it's also a tradition that you you feed um, the loved one before they pass on so they have a good um, journey to the spirit realm. And so 
the piece, if I really hope you see it, because it, it's unlike anything you can really, I can't explain it to you and I can't show it to you. You have to experience it. And so Casey did all the rendering. We probably saw some pictures. We had Christine Malott um, be our model and we scanned her, we scanned my vessel. And then I did the sound. And um, yeah, I don't know what else to say about that. But well, yeah. and it, it's based on a lot of research that you're doing. Yeah. And also, the clay is locally harvested, right? You did things to make that clay white. And what I, I loved when Casey told me she was going to include a clay vessel beside the VR work because ectoplasm is described in the literature in the 20s as potter's mm. clay. It's a molding material like potter's clay. And even Chris in his work describes, a, he has a quote from the ghost that talks about Okay. All right. I, I'll just okay. But so to have the this experiential VR, but then to have that object, I really like that com combination. So that was a really nice addition. Yeah, and I just I also want to say that if you do manage to go see the piece, um, the intention, the, the the whole point of it is you actually see her spirit lifting from her body. Now people have a tendency to get focused on the <coughs> thunderbird that's flying overhead. Um, I recommend watching it several times and then uh, there is a moment and it happens really quickly. Just like in life, um, the spirit leaves really quickly and, and because it's the boreal forest, it's a dark night, um, you can barely see it, but it's there, so. Is this, was it, it was a body that was found? Yes. And it had died, like it wasn't a murder, or wasn't a... Like no, she, it was a burial, she was buried with her tools. Okay. Yeah. Um, another... Burial. Yeah. Okay. So there's actually a book, um, Kevin Brownlee was part of that process of excavating her body, uh, the Manitoba Museum was part of it, and there's actually uh, two books, um, one actually talks about the excavation, and then the second book is... Uh, Kevin worked with um, William Dumas, and they created a book called um, Finding My Miskinau, which means my life purpose. And so they're imagining what this woman, her childhood was like. And so it has like all this information. Yeah, so she's from like 1900, 1800? Uh, this was... Uh, when you said about three or four hundred years three ago. Three or four hundred years ago. A long time ago. Okay. She did have some objects that were um, from Europe, but they surmised that she never actually met and the settlers like or explorers. It was through trade route that she had access to um, a metal um, bead that was found on her. Yeah. Chris. So I'm going to uh, refer to my notes because as an artist, I always assume that everyone knows what's in my head and <laughs> start describing my work. I'm going to gloss over important things if I don't. But I will start with that quote. Um, so this is a quote from Intention and Survival, which was a book written by Lillian Hamilton and her son James Drummond, um, published in 1942. And you can actually access it online. So if, if this does interest you, um, you can you know, read um, uh, the uh, steps that they took in their, in their seances and so forth. But uh, the quote is, you must understand that I am working with different clay here. And this was spoken by the spirit named Walter through the medium Mary Marshall's voice. And this, um, just really excited me, um, and this is the entry point for me into the archive, um, because it was linking the ectoplasms emerging during the seances with the materiality of clay. So um, even though my um, practice has a lot of theory around it, it's, it the root is always um, about making and uh, messing around. And even though I'm dialoguing with technology, I never leave um, the handmade, and it's usually paint, um, but I see paint more as um, analogous to any materia prima, like clay. Um, and so this sort of delves into 
um, the, uh, the underpinnings of what the Hamiltons were dealing with. So um, clay and paint have a, a similarity through the physical component of silica, but philosophically, they're also imbued with the magic of this idea of materia prima or first matter. And it's the starting material required for alchemy. So alchemy being turning base metals into precious ones like gold. And that's always what I'm sort of after when I'm painting. It's, it's really something else. It's this life force or ether. And um, so it's part of the primitive formless base of all matter, similar to, similar to chaos or ether is part of this language um, of the Hamiltons and their archive. And uh, especially ether as a theoretical universal substance believed to act as a medium for transmission of electromagnetic waves. So um, practically speaking, just so you know what I did, um, my piece is called Seance Room. And it's a sculptural installation and it's constructed of dried uh, acrylic paint strokes suspended on monofilament. And um, my first entry into the archives is really not about the archives. <clears throat> I went to see the Hamilton House in person by mistake. So there's a synchronicity for you, right? So I'm talking to Serena. We bonded over um, spiritualism and I was working on a show called Dark Matter, um, which I might talk more about in the third aspect because it sort of dealt with, with my father's death. Um, and a lot of artwork does come out of death. But um, she said, oh, I'm working on the show around this archive. It's really interesting. And so when I was back in Winnipeg, um, I went to see it. And a friend of mine called me up one day and said, I'm interested in buying a house. I'm looking at this house. Do you want to come with me? And I said, OK, where is it? It's on Henderson Highway. OK, how much is it? Well, it's $450,000. And, like, and it has no yard. OK, well, let's go look at it. And so I arrive outside of this house. And it's like, I think I'm doing work um, for a show based on this house. So I quickly figured it out. And yes, that was the case. Um, and uh, my friend said, oh, yeah, that's right. But you can't say anything to the real estate agent because they'll freak out and they won't show us the house because so many people are coming just to see it, not to consider buying it. So anyways, my friend um, kept this real estate agent busy in the basement. And the basement actually looked like something out of American Horror Story because he has had his surgery in the basement. He was a doctor in the basement, right? And so there's like troughs for the blood. It's still there, um, set in like weeping wells around a surgical table and sort of lights. And anyways, they're downstairs. I run upstairs and I'm quickly taking pictures of the room I think is the seance room. And I found out later it was. Thank goodness. And so my piece really deals with this idea of what in occult terms would be called a correspondence, where there's two overlapping realities at the same time. And so one overlapping reality is the, um, I think it's 15 year period where they held seances in this room. Um, and the energies that may have been there, built up there. And then, um, the other part, half of the correspondence is my being in this room in 2020 and um, seeing an arrangement of furniture that was there then. It was the owner's son's bedroom. Interestingly, there was a crucifix on the wall. And I don't know how many sort of young sons would, his bed was unmade, like he was a typical sort of teenage guy. And yet there was a crucifix on the wall, so anyways, I thought that was interesting, a little little side note. Um, but um, I wanted to just read this. Uh, the seance participants in the past were attempting to move from the third dimension to the fourth dimension. So they were physically in this room and they wanted to go into something unknown, where time and space as we know it collapses using mediums and the tools of the seance. So that was their clay. 
um, moving paint from the two-dimensional surface to the three-dimension through suspension is part of my alchemical like program to see the unseen and sense the unsensed. So I am trying to attempt alchemy with my piece. And so my piece is, is just a recreation of these two um, realities of, of the room. So I think if you go see it, you'll see the materiality of it and understand um, an attempt to portray chaos. Thank you, Chris. I always make Chris tell me things three or four times because it's very dense, very theoretical. I confuse myself sometimes, so <laughs> but he, you're like for letting the, me read. the physicist uh, artist, but also he knows more about occult theories than almost anyone I know. Um, and my class is here, and we're we're all learning about the fourth dimension and um, the ether and Bergson. So I'm, I, you guys, I hope your ears are twitching because Chris knows all the answers. Well. <laughs> did your friend buy the house? I, I, <laughs> she did not. I wish she had. That was a money pit. <laughs> yeah. Well, especially with the basement. With the yeah. Blood. There was and no <laughs> staircase. Like, like oh, it was like an old Victorian, and the the nice grand central staircase was taken out yeah. in the sixties. Oh. It was turned into um, a new age herbalist sort of establishment, I think, for umpteen years. So it, it had paneling and potted palms, and, you know, rattan chairs and things like that. So Gags Unlimited bought it, and right. that's where they are, which is maybe fitting <laughs> in some ways, because ectoplasm is a bit of a gag. But I also was in the basement. There's a beautiful safe there, safe. but it, it was his it. surgery. And, you know, in the 20s, a doctor did everything. So mm -hmm. there was, like, cut marks on the wood from, like, the surgery. It is pretty brutal, but yeah. we thought it would be a great... A medical seance museum, but do we it need, would be an amazing museum. But you know, who has the money to do another museum in Winnipeg? So, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I think we're doing pretty well. Um, the third round, so um, you know, I, I think you guys are getting a really good sense of this archive that I worked in for more than four years. It's very, very rich, and there are so many different ways that I could have interpreted it. So one is gender roles, and some of the artists have played into that. The other one is how science is constructed. Science changes all the time. What was hard science in 1920, we laugh at now. Um, the rise of modernist photography, you know, Hamilton was really on the ball about taking modernist photographs. He displayed them in the 1930s, very early in Canada to display scientific photography, um, and they've been very well received. But the other lens, I think, for this group is maybe bereavement rituals, or what about magical thinking and superstition? So, you know, um, we all know that the Enlightenment project was to end folklore and superstition, and yet this whole experience has made me realize that it's, it is not at all suppressed. It's quite there, sort of. Um, you know, waxing and waning. So the Hamiltons began this project um, almost exactly 100 years ago, right? The 1923 is when he seriously started. And it was completely well supported by Winnipeg settler elite, prominent doctors, lawyers, reverend, uh, reverends from the United Church, even Prime Minister Mackenzie King praised his research. When Conan Doyle came to um, Winnipeg to give his lecture on the proofs of immortality in 1923, Winnipeggers were in a position, I think, that's very similar to us today. They were coming out of their own pandemic, and they were grieving the many losses in this city. And remember, Hamilton is a doctor, his wife is a nurse, so they administered to many people who died. But also, I think that Winnipeg was grieving its loss. Uh, the, its loss is the third largest Canadian city. Its loss is the Chicago of the North. After 23, it never, ever again regained that kind of status. Um, and Conan Doyle, and the letter is in the archive, in 1923, he says, Winnipeg is more of a psychic center. And he was almost prescient in giving us this alternative history that we are all following here. So for the last round, I think I want to move into something more philosophical, um, maybe this celebration of magical thinking that we've been talking about, the coincidences, the weird um, you know, intuitive level, the synchronicities that happened. Um, I think all of you are sort of open to the idea of spirits, which I did not think was usual, but in this room, maybe. 
Um, so I want to hear more about your intuitive practice. And I'll just tell you that um, I wonder if it's also a bit generational, because my grandma read tea leaves. And when she passed, there was a bird that came to the backyard. And my mom said that was her mom. And she talked to that bird every day. And I was like, yeah, OK, I'm sure it's Nana. I mean, like, I didn't, it, I mean, it didn't, it's just a thing that happened. And nobody thought my mom was bizarre, weird. No one got mad at her. We were like, oh, yeah, that's Nana. Hi, Nana. So what do you think about magical thinking and superstitious thinking? How can we reframe it today? I love it. <laughs> um, I think it goes in line with my, oops, it goes in line with my uh, love for the idea of possibilities. Uh, and you know we have similar stories. So my when my uncle passed, now my nephews and my niece will run to the window because whenever they see a cardinal, they're like Uncle Mike's visiting. So they run out and they they see Uncle Mike visiting. Mm -hmm. um, so that yeah, I don't know. It's a bird thing. It's a bird thing. <laughs> yeah. uh, I I do I do really like to think about the idea of following my intuition. I try not so much now to. Um, Think about it so hard to the point where it's like it's forced. It's more of something that I allow to have been naturally. And it's funny because pre-COVID, I'd say I was like really tapping into it in ways that just felt really natural and good. And then COVID happened and something shifted in me. And now I'm finding it to be much more challenging to have access to that space that I was able to access before. So that's been a shift, uh, a hard shift for me to kind of become accustomed to. In my practice, I have worked with psychic mediums to collaborate with artists who have passed. Um, the one who kind of stays with me and who's always with me is Gertrude Stein. Uh, Stein's always kind of by my side and, and nudging me in, in kind ways. So she can be kind of pushy, but <laughs> um, so I like to be open to those those ways of thinking because I often think to myself, if I what do I have to lose in believing that, say, someone like Stein is really like cheering me on from the sidelines and, and pushing me forward, similar to thinking that my grandmother um, is always kind of behind me and by my side as well. Uh, that is something that I quite believe in. And I would say, you know, it wasn't until I maybe 30, 35, where I was like, I'm just going to talk about this openly. Because before that, I was so scared to do that. I thought people would think that I would be, you know, not really OK. Uh, but then I guess something happened at 35 where I was like, I don't care. Um, and so I just started speaking <coughs> from, that, from that place. Uh, and it's really. What's really interesting to me is seeing how many people, when I'm openly talking about it, how many people would come to me and be like, I actually believe in this too. Mm -hmm. And they share their little secrets and their little experiences, which I find really quite eye-opening and lovely to, to allow for more space for that. Thank you. Um, magical thinking, wow. Um, definitely, uh, it was kind of funny because Leading up to the opening in September, um, I've had a bit of bad luck lately because, well, number one, my cat decided to um, not eat for a while. And he actually, we ended up putting him down the day after the opening. So then I was like, I wonder if I should have been in this exhibition. And then after that, our porch got broken into and my bike got stolen. So I was waiting for the third thing to fall, <laughs> but it hasn't happened yet. So um, yeah, so I was just like, why is this all happening now? And it's like, you know, I love this exhibition. It was a great exhibition, and, and it still is. And, and then, but yet I had these sort of rings of bad luck. I mean, Milo, who was my cat, was um, 13 years old and was diabetic. And, 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 that, and he decided that week that he didn't want to eat anymore. So it was just kind of strange that it's just like, what's going on here? Um, but um, but magical thinking, yeah. So um, definitely, um, I really study stuff sort of more on the Asian part of things and, and sort of superstition through um, sort of the, the diasporic lens of, of, of folklore and, and stuff like that. So a little background with my me again is sort of um, my grandfather was in the Filipino 
in the Philippine Navy, and he was stationed in Hong Kong. I didn't meet my grandfather until, you know, I, I, I didn't meet him because he, he had died before I was born. But he ended up having two wives. So I have a Chinese grandmother and my grandmother who came with me, uh, who came with us in the 70s. So I sort of have um, um, sort of agency in both sort of like the Asian Chinese uh, folklore and the Filipino folklore. They're very similar, but um, my grandmother was always sort of um, telling us things about, um, you know, the other worlds and, and sort of, and then being Catholic and being an altar boy, you know, you're immersed in this sort of, this spiritual culture of, of things that magically have happened you know, through, you know, Catholicism. So um, it's always been in me, and I always sort of strive for those influences in my work. So, um, yeah, so, and yeah, I always like the sort of, the strange and the and the, and the sort of um, out there sort of storylines in, 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 in pop popular culture and everything. So it's always been in, in, in me, so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, well, I have always used intuition in my practice, um, and I would often say that I'm one with the universe because things often work out for me, and uh, I said that once, I think it was at the Nibe gathering, and I don't remember the elder, and it's so important to me now that you name the elder, but um, I can't remember her name, but she said to me, no, it's the elders that are speaking to you, the spirits, those ancestors. So they're the ones that are guiding you and your decisions. So uh, after that, I'm like, okay, from now on, I'm gonna be, instead of saying one with the universe, it's the ancestors that help and guide me. And then it brings back that teaching of like, the past is always with you, the present is there, and then the future is also with you and conducting in your choices and things like that. But um, Chris and I were talking at the opening and I was like, oh, you know, I actually, I didn't actually believe um, in like those ghost energies and that like, people experiencing them because I had a friend who lived in a place that was very active that she claimed and I slept over at her place many times never experienced anything and she'd tell me stories about how the ghost saved her daughter from climbing up the stairs when she was a baby and how how it knocked over the the um, a chair so it couldn't go up so she couldn't go upstairs or how they would turn off the lights and prevent her father from being able to I mean um, her husband from being able to keep studying because the ghost was looking out for him make sure that he goes to bed and get plenty of sleep and I just heard these stories and and it wasn't until I was at her place and we were having a little get-together my niece and her her daughter were upstairs sleeping and uh, we were just quiet we were making loud noises or anything. And um, there was a candle with, um, it looked like a lampshade that was over top of this, this candle. And all of a sudden, a picture frame fell. And so my friend said, oh, it's the spirit. She's telling, letting us know we're being too loud. And I said, oh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> like, it was probably just a faulty nail or whatever. And then... <laughs> the lampshade popped off. <laughs> like it just literally went plop after I had said that. And I thought, what? <laughs> and she's like, no, no, that's the spirit. And that, that was like the first time I'd ever experienced anything. And I, I often say that I'm like, I'm not very sensitive to those kind of energies. Um, so uh, I'll give you another example. I, I used to watch Ghost Hunters. And you know how you, they talk about those orbs? And I'd be always like, oh, that's dust, or oh, that's like bugs flying into the screen or whatever. Um, during 20, the pandemic, we had to, I had to videotape my son doing this golf course that he created. And so I was filming it. So here I am, I have my camera and I'm filming it, but I'm also looking at him. And as I look at the, as I'm filming, I see this orb. And I'm looking at, I don't see any orb with my physical eye and there's this orb flying on my film. And my aunt had just passed away. She had passed away and we think maybe of COVID. And um, this was early into the pandemic, like April, 2020. And 
I, uh, I was then, I was like, oh my God, it's my aunt. And she stayed with us for a long time. Like I, I did several videos and she kept coming and coming. Wow. I did about 10 videos and then she eventually left about the eighth one. And I went to different locations and tried it and it kept happening. Wow. So that was like, holy moly. <laughs> Um, and then I had another experience where uh, we were visiting my, the gravesite of my grandmother, and I was taking a picture of my niece and my um, my my cousin. And the first picture, there's trees in the background, the sun starting to come down, but the sun's behind me. Um, and the two, it's a beautiful picture of the two of them. And then I didn't do it, but my flash engaged. So my second picture, there's this bright orange um, light that was hovering between the two of them. And for the life of me, I could never recreate that ever again. So my mom was like, that's your, that's my mother, that's your grandmother. So it was, um, it was, it kind of made me a believer and it started making me really think about how all of us are really energy. And scientists say that we can't destroy energy. Energy will just manifest itself into something else. And so when a spirit passes and when they leave their body, that energy goes elsewhere. And so that's why we see these signs and these, these um, you know, sometimes manifesting in a bird or manifesting in, in a butterfly or, or something else. Um, it's these energies that have moved on to a different creature and is there just to give you a sign. At least that's my belief. Um, there's a really good book by Jung called um, The Paranormal and Synchronicity, which I would recommend people read if they're interested in this. And, you know, I think we tell ourselves that um, we want to make sense of the world, so we, we make connections and, and formulate stories, which I think is a flip way of looking at that there are these um, spiritual happenings and we're just not open to them, right? So I totally agree with Erica. When you, when you open yourself up and start to see the relationships that are in the universe around us, you can't help but see the interconnectedness of things. And I always tell like, like the, um, most aggressive disbeliever, like I say, all you have to do is live in a major city on a moon, like a full moon, mm -hmm. and people act crazier. They're <coughs> on the street, and why is that? There's something to do with the um, amount of water we have in our body and the tides, and this all links to astrology, and that's just like a real sort of simple, concrete pedestrian example of how these things sort of affect us. So. Um, I can tell you two sort of paranormal encounters that I've had, which um, one, I was reading um, the book of spirit communication by Raymond um, Buckland. And it's serious stuff. You shouldn't play around with this stuff. Um, and uh, I was reading the chapter on, on communicating with the dead. And I was in a Halifax uh, hotel room. I was there for a show and two, two spirits came to my room that night. It was early in the morning and I woke up and there were two figures that entered the room and the only way I can describe them is that they were sort of mathematically embedded in the fabric. Um, and I see all of this as very mathematical. Um, if you think of the way, like that saying, you know, where you click, in the, like you have a day that you really click, which means you sort of fit in like a piece of Lego. And there's something that's working in terms of numbers that day. Um, I teach uh, 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 design theory and we talk about the golden mean and the golden ratio um, and how that relates to even just physically how you relate to the world. Why some people have better luck because of the way they look or some people you know, um, have a good day. And um, if you think of like Greek sculpture, these archetypal forms that are made solely by the golden mean, right, and the golden ratio. So th there's something there for me um, in terms of numbers and numerology. And the last one I want to share 
which is sort of appropriate for today. So um, I was talking to Di Thornycross. She said, oh, you're a father. And um, I'm actually expecting another child, hopefully. We're waiting to hear today if my surrogate is pregnant. And when we met her and had all the dates arranged, um, her birthday fell on the um, the uh, day of uh, the, uh, tr um, what word am I looking for? The embryo transmission. And uh, it was the 11th, and her birthday was the 11th, and it was the 11th of October. And um, scientifically, the embryos just have to have a designation. I only had one, and it was number 11. So uh, just, you know, it's, it's something synchronistic, and uh, I open myself up to it. And uh, the number 11 means a spiritual awakening. Um, so yeah, it happens a lot to me. Wow. <laughs> if you open yourself up to it, you'll see that. So we don't have a lot of time left, but Catherine, do you want to send out a few ideas or some questions or? Sure. Um, yeah, I think this discussion has been really exciting to me, especially this last sort of part about, I think we're very much seeing that if modernity is supposed to be devoid of magic, maybe not so much. I don't know that that theory holds anymore. And that really fits nicely with um, these comments that I want to share. So while I was preparing for this panel, I accidentally wrote down the name of it incorrectly twice. It's called Unsettling the Spirits, but the first time I wrote it down, I wrote it in my calendar as um, Unsettling the Archive, and then later I wrote it down <laughs> as Unsettling the Settlers. <laughs> I'm like, okay, normally just brush that kind of thing off, but then I was like, you know, Freud is always lurking nearby, so let's, if we're talking about psychical research and mediums, so let's, you know, dwell on these Freudian slips or Freudian typos for a minute. Um, so I think implicit in that first mistaken title, Unsettling the Archive, is the idea that the archive itself is actually a, a settler institution. It's an instrument of colonization through which the West classifies, collects, and represents other cultures according to its own epistemological framework. Uh, and what gets preserved in the archive and what gets excluded is very much an expression of power. The power to self-fashion one's own narrative and the power to represent the other. And as Dr. Kashebji has noted uh, in her introduction to the art of ectoplasm, the Hamiltons and their colleagues were white settlers and like many settler groups engaged in seances during this time. Uh, they communicated with the alleged spirits of indigenous peoples. Uh, for example, in addition to Walter, as you mentioned, one of Mary Marshall's trans personalities or spirit controls was named Black Hawk and his presence was indicated uh, through changes in Mary Marshall's mannerisms and speaking style. And these uh, sort of shifts were very much drawing on very disturbing uh, stereotypes of indigenous peoples. Um, the Hamilton social status as settlers, their appropriation of indigenous identities, and the careful record keeping and documentation procedures through which they fashioned themselves as pioneering scientists exploring the hitherto undiscovered territory of the spirit world demonstrate that the projects of spiritualism and psychical research and the project of colonialism, or settler colonialism rather, are inextricably entangled. And that brings me to the second uh, mistaken title that I came up with, which was Unsettling the Settlers. So there's the story that we settlers, and especially academic ones, uh, like to tell ourselves about Western modernity, and it goes like this. Once upon a time, the world was enchanted with ghosts and ghouls and daemons and deities, but then the world was gradually disenchanted because the enlightenment happened, thanks Europe, and the science was discovered, and the world was you know, somehow uh, divested of all of these uh, extra human agencies and mysterious forces. So according to this story, the Hamilton's experiments with occult phenomena like ectoplasm, telekinesis, and spirits constitute an embarrassing step backwards on the march to modernity. You know, there's this sort of, how could a scientist, a medical doctor, believe in ghosts? Um, but as Dr. Kashevji emphasizes, as our panelists uh, have, have uh, discussed today, and as most historians of science would agree, what the Hamiltons were doing was considered science at that time. So in this sense, uh, the Hamilton archives are unsettling to settlers because they challenge this triumphalist narrative of Western modernity as, uh, in which science figures as a mechanism of disenchantment. 
So as a PhD student from a settler background, my own work on the Hamilton's psychical research is informed by these ideas about unsettling the archive as a colonial institution, and also about unsettling this uh, narrative, which I think we can say is kind of has some holes in it, um, about modernity as a process of disenchantment. So I want to turn this question over to our panelists and ask, in what ways or for whom is the Hamilton archive unsettling? And what or whom do you hope the art artwork in the Undead Archive unsettles? Uh, you might want to speak to either your particular work or the exhibition as a whole. Well, yeah. <laughs> I kind of feel like I should take this on. <laughs> um, uh, so when, when Serena and I first started talking about uh, my participation, um, I, I didn't even want to have anything to do with the Hamilton Archive. In fact, I haven't even seen it. And, and that was a conscious choice, and that was a choice because I knew what it was going to be about. And I knew that there was um, a perspective that, where my voice was not there. And I knew that if my voice was there, it was distorted. And um, so I told her, I don't want anything to do with that. Instead, I want to talk about my own perspective. And she agreed that it was important to have that indigenous voice. And Serena really um, was uh, amazing in, um, because I'm talking in vague notions. And she's just like, OK, we'll just go with it. We'll just go with it. But, um, uh, I address this in in the book, actually, um, and how we were often in front of the camera and never behind the camera, and so our voices were never heard. So when I was creating this piece, um, I really wanted to bring forward the the importance of uh, sto uh, storytelling. I really wanted to bring um, our voice in a way that people could connect to, without getting caught up with um, colonialism. Mm -hmm. And I feel, like, I feel like I did that. I feel like I, I'm a very subtle person. And when I do things, I'm not going to be confrontational about it. Instead, I'm very multi-layered in the way I present my ideas and thoughts. And so I draw you in. I show you the beauty. But then I make you realize that um, the different harms that are at the surface of, of my work. And I hope that answers your question. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I would sort of add to that, too. I wasn't as interested in the archive as the idea <laughs> of the archive. Um, I think it is a jumping off point to discuss all sorts of other things as well. And for me, it's this idea of, um, like in the West, we've been given this um, short end of the stick with enlightenment. Like all of this stuff went underground and became arcane knowledge that was kept by a few, right? And it was kept from the public and the masses while we were all sold this idea of progress and technology and this demystification of the world. Um, so, I mean, it, it, for me, it sort of, the archive sort of continues that a bit. And um, I saw the archive. Serena took me there by the hand. <laughs> <laughs> and it was interesting. I love archive rooms even more than what's in. I like just, you know, the idea that things are taken care of and the idea of OK, the truth is coming and, out now. But, um, and the photos are, are, are um, interesting aesthetic statements 80 years later. Um, but I, I'm not particularly interested in the personalities. It's, it seems to me a very 19th early 20th century thing. When I was reading about my own ancestor, I got this book on Yeats and the occult, and I thought, oh, this is going to be really interesting. And it was just who was backstabbing who, and who left this society because they didn't like that person, and then this society was created, and that society was created. And it was, it was a soap opera. Mm -hmm. um, so 
th that's like a whole avenue that one can go down, which didn't necessarily in interest me either. Mm -hmm. um, I think it just unsettles notions. Like when I tell my friends, you know, my son's friends, parents at school about the exhibit, they feel unsettled. Like they, it's not part of their daily life to think about things like ghosts and spirits in the afterlife. And it should be. We're only here for a few decades. And, mm -hmm. You know, we should be thinking of our, our mortality, but it, it, there's no venue really in the world to do that, so. Yeah, I think unsettling our mortality is a theme, and I'm sorry, I think that there's a relative here or something, because you have a tiny little bug on you, Chris. He can stay there. Yeah. As long as he doesn't bite me. I just figured we might want to say hi, just in case. <laughs> no. Uh, I think there's beauty in the fact that we our, and Serena has invited us to unsettle the archive by becoming a part of that archive. Because mm -hmm. um, now our work will be spoken in relationship to Hamilton's work. Um, and that to me is like this subversive act that's really mm -hmm. quite exciting. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, I can't really add anything. I, I agree with Chris and stuff. Like, I, I saw the archives when I was a student, so in the 90s, but. When I created the piece for Serena, it was sort of an afterthought for me. I, I was more into what was going on in my life at that point. So, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. I think this was an amazing panel. You guys are all so articulate. And um, I think get, have given you guys a, an example of both the archive, but also the art. So I hope you do go and see it. Uh, Jennifer's keeping the gallery open, so we can take our questions to the gallery, right? Um, I know the technicians want to clean up the room, so uh, thank you so much to everyone for coming out and for the artists and Catherine speaking.